Hello and welcome to chapel today. We're very glad that you're with us. And uh, I don't know about you, but let's just take a deep breath. I've been running and getting things ready and you may have had a hectic day as well. So let's just take a deep breath together and go. Oh, yes. <laughs> that feels better, doesn't it? Just helps, doesn't it? Um, I had a friend who used to say, she would breathe out my stress, God's peace, my stress, God's peace. I like that, don't you? I need to remember to do that more often. Well, let's begin with um, praying together the Lord's Prayer. Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I thought I would read for you Psalm 46, 1 and 2. And um, we'll see what that says, and then we'll, I think I have another one to read. Ah, my paper is stuck. Yes, 46, 1 and 2. And then we're going to read Psalm 17, 6 through 8. So Psalm 46, 1 and 2 says, God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the worlds fall apart. Now I want you to read, read it or hear me read it like this. God is my refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why I won't be afraid when the world falls apart. Makes a difference when you read it that way, doesn't it? Speaks more personally to us. And now hear these words from the 17th Psalm. I cry out to you because you answer me. So tilt your ears toward me now. Listen to what I'm saying. Manifest your faithful love in amazing ways because you are the one who saves those who take refuge in you. And what we, what we just read, God is my refuge. You are the one who saves those who take refuge in you, saving them from their attackers by your strong hand. Ah, that's encouraging, isn't it? Well, let's sing Amazing Grace, and then we will read uh, another of the directions for singing from John Wesley. Exactly as they are printed here, 
without altering or mending them at all. And if you have learned to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. Number three, sing all, everybody join in. Number four, sing lustily and with a good courage. We don't use that word in that sense that much anymore, do we? But <laughs> sing, sing out, you know, with a good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep. So wake up, wake up now, we're ready to sing. But lift your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sang the songs of Satan. Hmm, wonder what the songs of Satan were that you sang. Something to think about, huh? Well, those are our first four. We have three more to go. So uh, the next three weeks, we'll continue to read our uh, directions for singing. Our first hymn today is a very old and very familiar hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. Leviticus 19.2 says, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Let's sing, Take Time to Be Holy. today. Now, this afternoon, I could hardly yeah, get my uh, sounds out today. Uh, let's sing. Let me read another verse of scripture for you, a few verses. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16 says, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's sing that one more time. Oh, now let me read to you the second verse. I wanted to read this verse, the third verse. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever betide. I need to hear that one more often because I, you know, get something in my head that I think God wants me to do, and I just run out the door doing it. And, you know, it may not be the time yet. He may just be giving me the first idea, but I have a tendency to run ahead, so I need to hear that. Run not before him, whatever betide. Enjoy or in sorrow, still follow the Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Aren't those great words for us to remember? Let's sing that first verse again, Bill. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always, and feed on his is one of our favorites. This is my father's world. There are just such great be great words to this and it, it's written by somebody who has another great name. I think this is an interesting name. Maltby Babcock. Just yeah. There's something about that name that just makes me smile. Uh, and he wrote it in 1901. In Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2 we read, The earth is the Lord and all that is in it the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. And in Psalm chapter 50, verse
verse 12, we read these words. The world is mine, the Lord says, and all that is in it. So this is our Father's world. Let's sing that first verse, and then I'll tell you a little bit of something about this song. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. Well, as I said, it was written by Maltby Babcock, and he was a pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Lockport, New York which was not far from Niagara Falls. It was located between Lakes Erie and Ontario, so way, way, way up there. It was a lovely area, and it was Maltby's habit to hike and run in the hills just outside of the town. And he often was tell his secretary as he left his office to go for a run or a hike, I'm going out to see my father's world. It was one of those occasions that prompted him to write the stanzas of This Is My Father's World. Now, I have three in the music that I have. He wrote, want to guess? 16. 16 stanzas. So uh, we don't have that many in our hymnals, hymnals today, but it came originally with six stanzas. So let's sing that verse one more time. This is my father's world, and to our listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees. Skies and seas, his hands the wonders wrought. The second verse says, This is my father's world. Oh, let us not forget that though the wrong is great and strong, God is the ruler yet. He trusts us with his world to keep it clean and fair. All earth and trees, all skies and seas, all creatures everywhere. Though it, the wrong is great and strong, God is the ruler yet. And that reminds me of I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. For though the wrong seems off so strong. Yeah. Um, our next hymn is I Love to Tell the Story. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul wrote, when I came to you, brethren, brothers and sisters, he said brethren, um, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Oh, that's encouraging, isn't it? Catherine Hankey wrote this hymn, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about her in just a moment. Let's sing, I Love to Tell the Story. I love to tell the story of unseen things
1855 and 1856, at the advice of her doctor, spent a year in bed recovering her health. And it was during this time that she wrote 100, get that, 100 stanzas called The Old, Old Story. It consisted of two sections, The Story Wanted and The Story Told. In the story told, which is part two of the poem, The Old, Old Story, from which this hymn is taken, Catherine briefly summarizes the whole story of the Bible, from the fall in Genesis to Christ's birth, death, resurrection, and to the scenes of glory in the book of Revelation. It's a good reminder, this hymn is a good reminder that the story of God and his people throughout the ages should be our focus as Christians. And when we speak to others of the gospel, we must tell them the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Let's sing that one more time. I love to tell the story of unseen things of all, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story will be my theme and glory. to tell the story because those who know it best seem hungry and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And as I read that today, I was reminded that that's why we sing those old songs because we want to hear the old, old story again and again and again. And that's what these great hymns do for us. They tell us the old story of Jesus and his love. And so I just was reminded of why we are singing these great, great old hymns of the faith together each week. Our next hymn is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. This is an old song, and I'll bet you remember that one. Um, the, the last one, I Love to Tell the Story, is not in as many hymnals as uh, you may have thought. I grew up singing it, and, and I think you did, Bill, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's not in a lot of hymnals. And so it, that one may not be as familiar to some of you, but it's a great hymn, isn't it? It has wonderful, wonderful words. But I'll bet you know this one. Have thine own way, Lord. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6, tells us the story of the potter and his wheel. And that's really what this hymn is based on. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, Jeremiah writes, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Maybe not to the vessel, but it seemed good to the potter. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as the potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Let's sing that first verse, and you listen for those words, okay? Have I no way? Because she could not raise the funds to go, 
Hymn writer uh, Adele Pollard became inspired to write a hymn about um, God working in her life. At a prayer meeting one evening, she heard an elderly woman pray, it really doesn't matter what you do with us, Lord. Just have your own way in our lives. Oh, what a prayer. We would all do well to pray that every day, wouldn't we? Well, when Adele Pollard heard this, it came at a time, as she put it, of great distress of soul. She'd wanted to go to Africa as a missionary, but she'd been up, unable to raise the needed funds, as I mentioned. Upon turning, returning home from that prayer meeting, uh, she read and meditated on the story of the potter. And before going to bed that night, she wrote the four stanzas that appear in the hymnals today. Isn't that amazing? Have thine own way, Lord. Let's sing that first verse again. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. as every verse starts. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Sometimes I think that's how we are especially feeling with this ongoing pandemic. We are wounded and weary and so ready for it to come to an end. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. It's a great prayer, isn't it? Our next hymn is a, um, that one is a prayer. This one is a kind of a bouncy tune, and it is uh, something for us to think about because it speaks about what Christ says to his disciples, including us. So um, it ties together two biblical scenes. I'm going to read the story and you see if you can guess what the hymn is. Mm -hmm. Two biblical scenes, uh, first in Mark, uh, Mark 10, 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, asked Jesus, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. And Jesus responds, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized and they respond to Jesus we are able the second uh, portion of scripture that relates to that hymn Matthew goes on to tell a little bit more and he says we read also these words of Jesus to his disciples can you drink the cup I am going to drink and he, they answered we can we can and so this hymn is based on some of those words for us. And then there's another scene found in that is uh, refers to in the second verse. And it's uh, from Luke 23, 39 to 43, where Jesus addresses the two thieves on the, on the cross on either side of him during the crucifixion. And you remember that they were mocking him and giving him a really hard time. And then one thief changed his mind. And uh, he uh, asks Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you know what the hymn is? Are ye able? Are ye able? Let's sing that song. Are ye able, said the master, to be crucified? Oh, 
So when we sing this song, I'm always able, aren't I? It's spelled differently, so it's not am I able like this, really able. Yeah, it's spelled differently, isn't it? Are ye able? The second verse says, and this is the one the second story in Scripture referred to. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? Listen to these words. Are ye able to remember when a thief lifts up his eyes that his pardoned soul is worthy of a place in paradise? Jesus gave it to him unconditionally. We often put conditions on it, don't we? you got to get your act together before. No. It's not what Jesus said, is it? Today you will be with me in paradise. So that's a good verse for us to remember. Let's sing the first first verse one more time. Are ye able, said the Master, to be crucified with me? In the sturdy dreamer's answers to the death we follow. someone who wrote the text and someone else wrote the music but he wrote both some people are really talented aren't they they can he put those words together and then they can find the music that just you know comes out of them and it fits the words so well this hymn is a favorite uh, among many Christians the old rugged cross James 1 12 says blessed is anyone who endures temptation such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And this hymn talks about, till we, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Let's sing the first verse together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross And he was holding an evangelistic meeting in Michigan. And he was unable to finish what he had started uh, thinking about this song and putting maybe a few words together uh, until early in 1913 while he was holding another series of evangelistic series, uh, services. And uh, the, 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 song, the words to this song was not actually placed in very many hymnals until the 1950s. Isn't that interesting? It was very popular, but not in uh, most major hymnals uh, because they felt like it made so much of the cross and didn't really talk of Jesus. Really, the song doesn't say much about Jesus. It says cling to the cross. And so some people really found it a little bit difficult to, to think that maybe that song should belong or not belong in the hymnal. But it remains a very popular song among Christians. So let's sing that. One more time. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners. 
Hymnals. Was this in your <laughs> hymnal growing up? Uh, I found it, uh, as, yeah. especially as a duet. It just mostly sung It's a beautiful, it. beautiful duet. Mm. Um, I can't sing duets, so Bill, don't even ask, okay? Because I, <laughs> I don't do duets. So, um, But it is a lovely song, and it actually was one of my mother's favorite uh, songs. It's called Ivory Palaces. And um, Psalm 45, 8 says, All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia from palaces adorned with ivory. The, the music of the strings makes you glad. So ivory palaces and robes fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Let's sing the first verse and then I'll see what else I might want to share with you about this song. My Lord has gone so wondrous fine and earth and texture fills its fragrance reach to this heart of mine her joy and being thrills out of the ivory sing the alto, the alto because that sounds more like the melody except that when you get to um, uh, uh, only his great eternal, eternal joy you have to switch and eternal up. then you have to switch to the soprano so it's uh, eternal yes yes and uh, in some hymnals it's written I think as a duet yeah mm -hmm. it's not written in four part harmony so uh, it's just, but it's a beautiful song in the melody pretty melody is just lovely. Well, let me uh, let me just tell you a couple things. First of all, you know, I'm always harping about how we sing hymns and we sing words and we don't have, we either don't pay attention or we don't know what the words mean. And, you know, and I've told you about my Ebenezer that I had no idea what I was singing. Well, this is another one that I had no idea what I was singing because I had no idea what myrrh and cassia and aloes were when I was growing up. Well, cassia I'll enlighten you, is a class of plants, several species of which yield medicinal plants. And aloes, of course, are also plants that yield some medicinal, have some medicinal, medicinal and healing properties. And you know about aloe vera that has the uh, extract that you rub on sunburns and stuff and other things. And myrrh is an aromatic, a fragrant plant, resin, and it's used for incense and perfume. And so it says that um, the garments are wondrous fine and myrrh their texture fills and its fragrance reached to the heart of mine. And so that's where that comes from. So I thought you might like to know what you're singing. Uh, it helps, doesn't it? <laughs> it yes. makes a little bit more sense of the words. This song was written by Her Henry Bearclaw, Bearclaw, I don't know, something yeah. like that. <laughs> Born December 14th, 1891 in Yorkshire, England. In the summer of 1915, he was with an evangelistic team near the Presbyterian Montreat Conference Center in the hills of Asheville, North Carolina, which some of you may recall is where Billy Graham lived in Montreat, yeah. North Carolina. 
Uh, during the conference, Chapman preached uh, one night on Psalm 45. And verse 8, the one that we read about your robes being fragrant and the ivory palaces, caught Bearclaw's attention. And it was one of fav uh, Chapman's favorite themes and he had even written a book on it 22 years earlier called Ivory Palaces of the King. And so that's where Bearclaw got the idea for the song. They stopped on the way home, or as they were traveling, um, they stopped at a country store, and he stayed in the car while others went inside. And he was thinking about that message again and again. And the phrases of the, the song began, began to take shape. And so he wrote them down. And after getting back to the hotel, he wrote out the verses and the rest of the hymn. So that's an interesting thing about the, the writing of the song. Well, let's sing the first verse one more time. My Lord has borne so wondrous fine And further texture fills Its fragrance this heart of mine with joy my being thrills. Out of the ivory palaces into a world of hope. Only his great that we have sung that is an old hymn that I grew up singing and Bill you grew up singing this I think but again is not in as many major hymnals as you might think if you grew up singing it you think it's in all the hymnals but it's really not I had to search for uh, to find hymnals that had this particular hymn in it today uh, maybe it's because it says Christ receive all sinful men and uh, if you are so inclined, you may sing Christ Receiveth Sinful Ones or Sinful Folks, whatever uh, works for you. But, of course, when these hymns were written, men was generic and, you know, right. it was used for everybody. So we have to kind of, you know, give them a little grace as far as the words. But you sing whatever uh, really is comfortable for you. I'll probably sing men because that's what's in my head. Um, but it was written by Erdman and Neumeister. He lives from, lived from 1671, this is an old hymn, to 1756. Uh, he is actually a little earlier than the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley. So, I mean, the, the, this is old. Um, let's see. Uh, he, the verse, there's verses, oh, my tongue. The verses that it is based on are found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. We read, As he sat down at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him. This is Jesus we're talking about. And his disciples. You know, for some reason, I just forgot that the disciples. I just don't always think about that. Because Jesus is always called the friend of sinners, but the disciples are not. And sometimes they're a little questioning of Jesus eating with the sinners, but they actually happen to be there on this occasion. Okay, So as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And then we read in uh, verse 14, for just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I forgot to write down the text, and it's John 3. I'm sorry. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, for that whoever <coughs> believes in him may have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let's sing the first verse. Christ receiveth sinful men. Sinners Jesus will receive, send his word of grace to all, whose every pathway lead, all who linger, all who fall, sing, oh sing, and o'er again, Christ receive a sinful So I apologize for that. Um, excuse me, I feel a sneeze coming. Sinners, Jesus will receive. And what are we supposed to do? Sound the word of grace to all. All who the heavenly pathway would leave and all who linger and all who fall. We are to tell them that. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. The last verse says, Christ receiveth sinful men. Even me, with all my sin, purged from every spot and stain, heaven with him I enter in. Heaven on earth we enter in everlasting life. Well, let's sing that one more time. I guess I, I talked the sneeze away, didn't I? Sinners Jesus will receive, send his word of grace to all. collection and uh, it's always interesting to look through the hymnals you know one time I came across a thing that I shared this has been a couple of years ago and I guess now but it was um, an informal not scientific survey that a gentleman conducted about the signature hymns of denominations of various churches and he just wrote to, to people that he knew that were leaders in music uh, and said you know what are some of your church's favorite hymns and what most represent you in your church, you think. And uh, it was very interesting to me to read what the, the signature hymns of those churches were. And uh, I have no idea why I started this, because Guide Me, O Val Great Jehovah was one of them, but I don't I'm remember sorry, the church. <laughs> I don't remember the church. But it was very interesting. Oh, and I was talking about the hymnals, I'm sorry. And so uh, it was interesting to see the hymns that were in those hymnals that I had a couple of, you know, three or four or however many, I had not heard of. They were not in my hymnal growing up, and they are not in the Methodist hymnal, and they are not in the Baptist hymnal. And so I, they were hymns that I had not heard of. And, and yet they were very precious songs to people in those, that particular church. There were songs for Nazarenes. One of theirs was, I stand amazed in uh -huh. the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Uh, and there were songs from Anglican churches and, and, and churches of Christ and uh, any numbers, Baptists of churches and so on. But uh, it's interesting that uh, as, as different branches of Christendom, we have our own favorite hymns. And this one, I think, though, that you will find in most hymnals. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Let's sing the first verse, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about this hymn. Guide me, O the great Jehovah, pilgrim in this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Yeah. 
to share with you. And it's interesting that I happen to think about those signature hymns because somewhere it has in here. Um, this song, ah, oh, here it is. This song was written by someone who is Welsh. So it was sung in the British Isles a lot and was a very beloved hymn in the British Isles. And uh, it was used in worship um, in congregations around the globe and across denominational lines. Uh, but because it was so popular and so well known in uh, the British Isles, uh, two very famous television services of the last several de two decades um, used this hymn, and they are incredibly different services of worship. The first in 1997. Gosh, that's over two decades now, isn't it? I just thought of that. Uh, the first in 1997 was the funeral of Princess Diana of Wales. This song was sung at her funeral. And then the second one was in 2011, the royal wedding of Prince William and Catherine Middleton. Isn't that interesting? Because it's such a uh, significant hymn in the Anglican Church. So uh, I thought you might be interested in knowing that. Let's sing uh, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. <laughs> Guide me, O the great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art holy, hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no And so it is time for us to share in the 23rd Psalm. Will you read or recite with me the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's uh, bow, uh, bow or just keep your eyes open, whatever is comfortable for you, but will you receive this benediction? May the Lord of heaven and earth strengthen us, strengthen our knowledge that in Jesus, heaven has come to earth and earth has become the holy ground of God's saving work. May that knowledge bless us and keep us and strengthen us now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again.